Assalamu alaikum, hello. I've been wanting to do this video for quite some time. And this morning, I finally found the strength, compassion, the, I guess you could say, intrepidness, because I realized I needed to let go of fear in order to do this video. Now, I appreciate the topic of this particular video may be sensitive to some people, and it is not a video that aims to hurt or upset or um, judge anybody else. This is my opinion, my life, um, my experiences and my outlook on this particular topic and how it has impacted on me and other, other people that I know. So I just want to put a disclaimer out there that it's not my intention to um, ridicule, humiliate or ostracise um, anybody, okay? The topic of this video, which some of you probably out there can relate to, is to wear the hijab or not to wear the hijab. Now, throughout my life, um, this has been a questionable thing. And um, as I've got older, I'm in my 40s now, as I've got older, it's become more uh, resonant in me about my personal uh, relationship with God in my eyes in my faith, in my belief. And obviously I am born a Muslim, I've been raised a Muslim, I've lived as a Muslim. Um, there's been times when I haven't perhaps um, followed it through consistently, put my hands up, been honest about that. But each person has to have their own stepping stones in life. Each person has to resonate and be honest with themselves about their own personal journey with the person that obviously has put us here to hopefully learn some things about mankind. As we get older in our lives, obviously, like I said to you, I'm in my forties, we start getting closer relationships with God. It could be that you are um, practicing a particular faith that is not Muslim, but whatever it might be, whatever your spiritual journey is on this life and on this path that we all follow, we all have different lessons obviously to learn. As I've got older in life, my relationship with God has got closer. And I know other people that are the same as well. We go through that whole questioning stage. We go through the whole, why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I here to do stage? If you can relate to that. But the reason I'm uh, making this video is to talk about my relationship with wearing uh, the hijab or not to wear the hijab. Now, my own personal experience, I started off uh, been brought up in England, in Sheffield, steel industry. Um, I'm the eldest daughter of a Patan mother, Patan father. Patan basically means like a tribe, like a, a, a part of a, a culture, clan, I guess. Um, my great grandparents originally came from um, the north went north uh, sorry the northwest frontier of Pakistan so like, if you look in the old sort of uh, British Empire maps you can see it's right on the top border where it's not far from Afghanistan okay and obviously then on the other side you've got Iran and the language that we speak as Pushto uh, is um, obviously Pushto is mixed it's a blend of Farsi Dari and um, Iranian, as I've discovered actually working in the Middle East, it's, it's got a good mixture. There's been a lot of influences. And one of the things I've learned through the Middle East, it's got a big mixture of Arabic words as well, which I didn't really know before until working out in Arab countries. Now, the, the reason I mentioned um, the background to you is because um, you'll see from some of the images I share of my um, childhood, you know, brought up in uh, this household, raised obviously as a Muslim, identified as a Muslim, uh, went to junior school, infant school, went throughout um, middle school um, as a Muslim. Yeah, clear, you could tell, brown child in the room, um, because those days you didn't have many ethnic minorities. Um, I was born in 78. So early 80s, there was maybe three of us, maybe four of us in the classroom. The rest of our um, uh, people within the classroom, the rest of the students were white. Uh, I think we had one Caribbean boy, but maybe, and the rest basically was one boy, I think was his father was Pakistani, mum was white. So, it, but then that was a real taboo thing, if you know what I mean. Okay, so that's the background I'm coming from. Now, <clears throat> up until that point of school, 
Um, at no point was I forced to wear a headscarf. At no point was I told to wear a headscarf. Obviously, when I prayed and did my prayers five times a day, uh, especially on Friday, obviously, um, obviously you did Ramadan, various other things. During Ramadan times, I recall wearing the headscarf, but any other time I wasn't really wearing it. And obviously, as a child, your body develops. Um, when I got to the age of like 11, I shot right up. I was extremely tall. I mean, as a baby, if you look back at pictures, you can see I was tall, okay? So you stood out. But as I got older, and obviously as puberty set in, uh, the female body obviously develops and shows and you know it's clear to everybody everybody wow she's going through changes okay now for me personally uh, nobody in my family forced me at that time to wear the headscarf in fact what happened was I used to have beautiful beautiful long hair still got beautiful hair but really beautiful hair to the point where it was down like to my waist and further beyond and what happened was at school, somebody um, was doing this thing, I think it was a phrase at the time, where they threw chewing gum in the back of my hair. And because for school, it was a rule where you had your hair tied into like a ponytail, um, this chewing gum got so lodged in the back of my hair that there was nothing that you could do. And I remember coming home, this is before the days of learning, like you could use ice, you could use other things to try and get the chewing gum out. My mum obviously went ballistic, understandably, you know, she went ballistic because she got upset that someone's done this to her daughter and school's not done anything about it, but also mad that it's right in the centre and you can't do anything. And the only solution my mum had was to take a pair of scissors and to chop that hair off. Now I remember my dad coming home from work and going mad, mad because obviously I ended up with what I can only describe as like an Elvis haircut. <laughs> and uh, my dad, even though he's an Elvis fan, was mad, 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 mad at my mum and what she'd done. And understandably, it was gonna be visible that I was gonna be walking around with this like Elvis haircut. And I obviously didn't look like a girl. In his words, I looked like a boy. My dad's words, not mine. And I felt embarrassed as well. I felt embarrassed about going into school like that. And I recall the only solution I had at that time is um, it wasn't winter, but I had a snood. A snood is like uh, something that you wear here, obviously, like in the winter to just like look after your neck and to protect uh, yourself from the winter. And you pull it up and sort of like cover it. You can even put it over your head. So there's things you can do with the snood, but it was bright red. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to go into school. Don't want to go. I already get picked on as it is. I already got bullied as it was. For various other things and i kept those issues silent a lot of them were racist um comments racist things uh also being tall whatever it was that i i just didn't fit into the the crew around me and here i come in in the middle of summer wearing this snood all day every day to school not one member of staff questioned me about it not one member of staff pulled me up about it nobody said is there something wrong and the reason i say that is because now I am a teacher, I'm an educator, and to me that is the first sign of maybe there's some abuse going on, maybe there's something weird going on, there's something not right. I would have told the teacher, look, this is the situation with the chewing gum incident, and this it's not about abuse, because I know in some cultures when I've worked in education, um, I recall one girl from an African culture that I taught, um, I, I can't remember the culture, I'm sorry, but I remember she did something that her family didn't agree with and the, the family resulted with shaving her head, uh, her hair off and her head was bald. And she came into school with like a scarf wrapped around her head and it was, she was not Muslim, but she clearly there was something wrong. And I remember one of my colleagues being ushered in uh, who happened to be from um, Zimbabwe. And my friend went to go and resolve it because it was a culture thing and my, my head teacher didn't want to um, upset the family and obviously most of those situations can be resolved because they, they, the majority of people wear weaves okay that that was not my situation that was my that was not my predicament we don't do weaves in my culture <laughs> we don't we really don't but I digress anyway um for a while when I was wearing this nude if it was school assemblies and things like that we were always sitting on the floor it was the year 10 and 11s that used to sit in chairs but I think year 7, 8, 9 we used to sit on the floor 
and obviously you can imagine sitting on the floor there was one particular girl nasty nasty woman well nasty girl and later on as an adult she's not changed but she used to just sit there and like pull and yank my um my um snood off you know and i used to elbow her and i used to kick her i used to do all sorts to stand up for myself and i think at that time it sort of taught me the importance of like standing up for your rights and standing up for people that are doing things like that when i got home obviously i made the decision i'm going to start wearing a scarf this was my decision and i did it to cover up the haircut i did it to cover up the fact that i looked like a boy in fact i think I still have a one photo where it does clearly show clearly you can see this hair is like chopped to about there uh, and it was an Eid photo that I still have, so I'll I'll share that with you. Anyway, as I started wearing this headscarf, um, it felt right to me. It felt right to be part of this culture, part of my community, part of uh, growing up, part of embracing being a young woman, uh, part of my faith, part of my spirituality. All the way through my teens, felt the same thing. And people would question, people did ask me at school, why are you wearing this for, what's this for? And you've got to remember in those times, like I'm talking early 80s, early uh, 90s, and I mean very early 90s, people didn't really understand why somebody had suddenly gone from not wearing a headscarf to wearing one or vice versa. And, you know, a lot of the time I believe in telling people the reason so that they can understand, tolerate and understand and respect, I guess. Uh, where this other person or individual is coming from. Now, when I got a little bit older, those feelings changed within me. So I was t probably from 18 onwards, um, those feelings started to change and they didn't fit with me right, they didn't sit with me right, and I'll explain why. So there were incidences where family members, for example, would... Um, patronize, would dictate, would control, would have a real hissy fit if my headscarf, um, you know, was on my head and maybe one flicker of hair, and I mean literally a strand like that, was visible to the public. And I can remember working for the first time in my life when I was 18, I was working in a bank from the age of 18 onwards for about five years, putting myself through university and put myself through teaching and it became a real anxiety issue with me a real anxiety issue where um in this particular case it happened to me my father coming in to my place of work and basically harassing me um controlling dictating and i totally get before you before you think i'm criticizing i'm i'm explaining but i understand from a, a role of a parent as a male looking after his daughters, that's part of his duty, totally get that. I totally get the fact that uh, there's ways and means of um, looking after your people that are in your care and obviously being aware of your society and how you are represented and how you are judged. That's the issue I'm gonna come back to in a little while. But the point I'm getting at is it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And some of this is down to uh, family dynamics and it's down to issues that my father had not about me um, later on as an adult I've realized that more and more as my voice got vocal and not vocal in the sense that I've been rude and uh, disrespectful but vocal in the sense of laying out exactly what my interpretation is of the Quran and what someone else thinks and what other people do in society they're all different things these are these are things like culture tradition and basically fitting in with, um, you know, set rules, I guess, that you are raised on, not necessarily following the actual concepts of the faith that you are following, but you are more concerned about the aspect of what society thinks. You're more, you're more concerned about the judgment. And I think that's where some of the failing uh, happens. But in my particular predicament, this continued and it continued and continued to the point where I was having huge anxiety um, effects or impacts. I was having panic attacks. I was having a lot of things that weren't quite right. And it was based on this, this situation and other scenarios that continued. And I got to the stage where I guess I stepped back. 
and I left my family home and uh, left the culture and left the traditions and for 15 years I went on my own path and as a woman as a Muslim woman as a woman in her 20s to do that it's revolutionary um, also intrepid some people looked at it as stupidity or they made their own assumptions um, you know allegations rumor uh, I'm not going to go into that because that's going to digress from what we're talking about but I think you can make up your own mind about what community decided uh, about why I left now in those 15 years I stepped away and stepped away and stepped away from a faith and a religion that didn't seem to sit with me well, that didn't resonate with me well. And, you know, one of the people that I totally, totally, totally admire more so in my life as I've got older is Mufti Menk. And other scholars like him were, were told repeatedly, you know, don't judge this person. I, I've had so many people when I went through my particular journey of stepping away, saying to me, Astaghfirullah Azim, Astaghfirullah Azim, and, uh, you, you're going to go to hell, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And that's been hard. That's been hard. And I didn't realise up till now in my 40s that that small little stone, that small, small stone of judgment got bigger, 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 bigger. Almost like a cancer that you are carrying around on the shackles of your feet and you are entrapped and you are enslaved by those thoughts and by those conceptions and by that judgmentality. And there has to be a point where you have to stop justifying who you are, why you're doing something in a particular way or why you are not. And people just need, need to let you be and people need to let you uh, carry on with your life and accept it. And if they don't, there's the door. See you later. Bye. And that is not an easy thing to do. Trust me. It is not an easy thing to do. Coming forward... I moved abroad, I um, had rekindled with my family, okay, I had tried to build bridges again, I had um, tried to mend relationships with my family for various reasons. It doesn't hurt you to say sorry to that individual that has harmed or hurted you, even if they think their intentions were good and you think they're not, it doesn't hurt you to say sorry and meet each other in the middle and to forgive. Maybe not forget, but to forgive. And I got to the point where I had an almighty, almighty fight with my father. And we had bonded our relationship. We had bonded our um, kinship, bond of father and daughter, and it felt really good. It felt really good. If I choke up, apologies. However, I soon realised it was all a dream. And the penny dropped when my father, one particular day, after I had talked to him about something very, very, very intimate, very intimate, and I had disclosed some personal things about trauma, and I had disclosed that I needed him as my father. And I wasn't able to basically tell him some of the issues that had gone on with my life because it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right situation. I was having some counseling in my life, some CBT. And my father and I, we had had a very, very close bond, very close bond when I, when I was being raised. He, you know, for all my father's faults, bless him, mashallah, give him a long life. But he had, taught me a lot of skills about being independent. He'd also given me lots of opportunities of freedom. Uh, girls of my age, when they hit 11, they were sent back to Pakistan and got married off, okay? Um, this is reality of the generation I'm talking about. I'm first generation born. I was allowed to go to high school. When I say allowed, that's what exactly what I mean. I was allowed, other girls didn't. The, 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 there was only like four or five ethnic minority girls at my school, I was one of the few that was allowed to go to high school. And although we had our battles, and I'm talking big battles, of me 
wanting to go to university for the first time, you know, and that is a hard, hard, hard battle that I had to face. Being a Muslim girl and your parent not understanding that you can't go to this particular university because it needs this grade and it needs that grade and da da da. So there was all these trials in my life, which, you know, are there for a reason, aren't they? Allah sometimes or God, whichever, whichever faith it is that you believe in, tests you all the way. Now, in my dad's eyes, going back to this conversation that I'm talking about, um, we had what I can only call the most heartbreaking moment for me. My dad, basically, when I had been coming to the house, he saw me dressed in the way that I am. So I would consider it modest. Um, I wasn't wearing a shawa kameez, which is how I was traditionally raised and what to wear. My auntie, uh, who was a dentist and then got married later on and stopped being a dentist, she was the first one of our family to go to university, but she uh, was someone who like wore tights for the first time. She wore a little jacket. Uh, you could call that westernized, but that time that was quite revolutionary for us to see someone slowly changing their appearance to look sort of like westernized that's how my community and my culture would see that but that's not the reality it's just a pair of clothes but to my dad i was turning up obviously i had jeans on i had a top on um i always wore modest clothes i on purpose would be very careful about my appearance and what i wore so i wore longer dresses i wore outfits that looked more pakistani afghanistani uh, culture you know so that I wouldn't upset my family and maybe I wore leggings I wouldn't wear the the, uh, the pantaloon or pantaloon as we call it um, part of that outfit I just was respectful okay and when I wore tops and things like that they weren't all the way down they were they were respectful they were modest however mum and dad had had some sort of argument and when I came down I landed in the middle of it and I'll never forget what my dad said. So remember, 15 years we've not talked. We're rebuilding the bridges. We're trying to rebuild the connections between us. And my dad comes out with a comment of, you know, you're going to go upstairs with your mum and you're going to go and wear shawakamis and you're going to go start praying. You're going to go do this, this, this. And I remember it hitting me like a thunderbolt in my heart when he spoke those words because I realized he's very set in his ways. He's very set in his traditional ways and his cultural ways. And it hadn't really hit me until that moment. The other bit that obviously hurt me like hell was that this is my father and this is my mother and they don't accept me for who I am because I'm dressing in a different way. I'm looking in a different way. And to be fair, all through my life, if you look at it, I've always been different anyway. Uh, I stood out like a sore thumb with a lot of the things that I have done. And um, obviously the uh, clothes for him as a material concept and it's sort of like a, uh, because I was doing my masters at that time, we were doing all these theories about um, labeling and basically how we decide in a community to say this particular word. It hit me that for him, what made a Muslim was the shawar kameez and the scarf. To him, I had to identify as one of them. And I had to be part of that family group and look like them. It didn't matter if my style was different, that would also be forbidden. You know, nowadays, and I'll jump onto this later on, this topic. Nowadays, there's all these different ways of wearing the headscarf and the hijab. And wow, there's some women wearing it with some pure style, real style. But that, that isn't me. And I'm trying to explain, this is who I am. Um, it is my choice not to wear the headscarf. It is my choice not to. These are my reasons for it. And you're going to have to accept them. Okay. Now, he, he didn't. And unfortunately, he didn't. And I wept like a child. Wept like a child. And I remember... Uh, looking at him with utter disgust because he didn't accept his daughter for who he was and also and if I get emotional it's understandable 
the 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 bolt that i felt that thunder and lightning bolt i felt in my heart my heart cracked all i'd ever wanted was my family all i ever wanted was acceptance and love from my family and to me in the way that it was displayed through words or actions it didn't feel like that okay and it's not that i was deluded this is reality now when your parent is saying i don't want you doing this i don't want you doing that it's not as if i'm doing something illegal i'm talking about a material a material way of dressing a materialistic way of looking at how you are perceived and how you are perceived by either yourself your identity your self-awareness your whole concept of who you are to you the people around you the siblings the community all of these are titles these are all parts of either ego or id whatever you want to call it from a psychology point of view and these materialistic things don't make us who we actually are in here and in our soul and in our essence and in our being and in our conduct and that's the message i was trying to get across to my dad and i ended up having an almighty fight and some of you might sat there you might be sat there you can judge me that's fine i've always been patient i've always been polite in how i've responded back to our parents that's the way that we're raised but there are also times when you need to speak your peace and speak your truth and my father was very much like um, you dress like a man and you look like a man now this is because i wore trousers or jeans and i wore a long top for example now what had been happening is that my nieces and my um uncles um my uncle was extremely strict upbringing similar to myself but my uncle's uh, family had come to the house family house when i was there they all looked like the more westernized kids than me in fact they were wearing the similar outfits like me my niece in fact had got a beautiful little blazer and a jacket and a little long skirt and tights dressed exactly like me the same there was no difference I was the adult, she was the child, we're all modest in our own way, but this this is what I'm getting at, is that whole concept of um, someone else's perception and their, their understanding of what a Muslim looks like. And again, like I said to you, this varies upon culture, tradition, and the community that you are raised in. But the sole point of it, the, the core of it, is not about, I want you to be a Muslim, I want you to be respectful i want you to show barda barda is the word in i think hindi and urdu and i think in pushto as well and it's all about like um, be modest covering yourself up that's not what this was about this was more about control and it was about you will identify as this and my father said to me you know um you need to be like this and um those children in that house are dressed like that because the kids I said, well, if it's okay for them, why is it not okay for me? What's the difference? Do you see what I'm getting at? So in some cultures, there's this mixture between how we raise our children from a young age to older. And I'm not talking about generation. I'm not talking about different countries. What you do and how you raise your children is your decision. But it causes this conflict. It causes this confusion with some individuals, not all with some. And I could not understand my father's logic because you're raising children in that house. And my father's argument was basically like, well, uh, uh, they're kids and, um, you know, um, their um, their their mum's bought them clothes. I said, yeah, my mum, my mum, uh, sorry, my sisters have bought those clothes. And where do my sisters live? In your house. Who takes my sister to the shopping mall to buy those clothes? you do who's the one waiting outside when they've done the shopping you are who's the one that could be checking the bags then if you're going to be the fashion police or the muslim police in in regards to you know parda or modesty who's the fashion police then you are dad but you didn't check so before you're doing that whole thing about um you know it's not appropriate it's not appropriate item of clothing um check yourself before you wreck yourself as ice cube says now I remembered one of my childhood stories that I always loved, and that was the emperor and his new clothes. <laughs> you know that story? 
I'm not going to into it into too much depth here. There's a huge moral and didactic element to that story. Clothes don't make a person, the person does. I could be walking around in an Armani suit that cost me £3,000, $4,000, $5,000. But if my heart isn't clean and my deeds aren't clean and my actions aren't clean, the way I conduct myself, the way that I speak to you, the way I help someone else, if that isn't right, that's me not being a good human being. Before any religion, before you label any religion, whether it's Christianity, Buddhist, Jewish, um, or oh, there's so many religions out there, the clothes do, do not make a person. As and when we all face judgment day, depending on any religion you are in, as I said, we all have our own beliefs and we, we are here to respect and understand that. They have to look at the fact that this is a situation where you are judging me. You're judging me based on my clothing, based on my appearance. And I think that's what does it comes down to as well. Now, obviously that situation didn't end very well. And the relationship between myself and my father has been extremely rocky for the last five years and we're coming into the sixth year. There's been times where I have tried to rebuild bridges again, and it's not worked how I thought it would. Maybe that changes in the future, maybe it does not, I don't know. Anyway, moving forward, I decided to go and teach internationally, and I went to go and work in Egypt. I decided to leave things in England and to just go and travel, discover the world, see the world, and I must admit, in my two years of working in Egypt, and I'm now in the Middle East, I'm coming up to my fourth year of working in the Middle East, my whole concept of um, the Muslim faith and traditions and uh, basically being a Muslim and identifying as a Muslim woman has changed big time. In the time I was in Egypt, slowly, gradually, I started to become more modest and started coming back to the faith and started that journey of coming out of complete spirituality and no, 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 I don't wanna do this, don't wanna do that. It's a whole case of like, okay, let's just take this in baby steps. Let's just see where it leads. I had a wake up call where it dawned on me that this is the right time now to be a Muslim again, a practicing Muslim. So before you start making any judgments, as I said, each person has their own journey. Each person has their own path that they must lead. And I'm just being honest and open about mine. And when you come back to it, you come back to it with a fresh new slate. And basically you sort of question certain things for yourself. And you are in agreement with that for yourself because you have to be happy with whichever faith it is that you follow or decide to lead, you have to be happy in your heart that that is the right faith and religion for you. And when I had this, I guess, wake up call, um, I happened to be on my deathbed actually with typhoid. And for about a week, I didn't speak, which is <laughs> for some of you might be thinking, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a big thing but I didn't speak I was silent and I was having a wake-up call with God I believe at that time telling me come on sort it out come on it's time it's time to come back and I did I did and in my life at that time um, he's my husband now but I was um, engaged to a Muslim man. Now, I never saw that happening. I didn't. But here he was in my life and that I think also had an impact too. My husband, for all his faults, but all his strengths, made me feel like home. He talked quite a lot about religion in a spiritual way 
there's been times we've clashed there's been times we've debated there's been times when i've pulled him up on some things that aren't quite true the advantage that he has over me is that he speaks arabic fluently my husband's egyptian so he has that advantage of speaking arabic fluently so as and when i've been taught quran the quran from a young age we, we, we're given it ustaze and we're taught the verses we're taught the arabic but we don't get told the meaning which is a shame i think that's changing now but if i had that i'd be able to like verse a quote at you because i am like that and i'd be able to say this 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 but the journey with my husband mashallah subhanallah has been an interesting one at times a rocky one and at times a challenging one but at times a blissful very very blissful one and when we had to get married um officially we had the like nikah as we would call it in my faith we had like the like registration in the muslim faith but then when we registered it for the embassies that's different to when you get married like nikah wise um there had to be lots and lots of paperwork for me to say that i was a muslim and in egypt and it's the only place i must know it but in egypt I had to have a certificate to prove that I was Muslim. And I was like, eh? You can understand that. Maybe there are other countries, I don't know. But as far as I know, from when I was raised, um, we never had a certificate to say you're Muslim or you're not. You were a Muslim, that's it. So this was really, like really weird to me. Anyway, we had to go and see a sheikh. And in order to see the sheikh, I can remember... Uh, I had to take some photographs. I had to take the photographs with a headscarf on. And um, I can remember sitting there feeling extremely uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable wearing this headscarf because it felt wrong. I dressed like this throughout the day and then there I am taking a headscarf and this would be something that I would only do for, ha for example, I have worn a headscarf when I've gone to visit a mosque when it's a place of worship and I have to be respectful if I've attended a funeral or prayers or there's certain scenarios. Um, obviously, if I'm praying at home, I wear a headscarf or I cover my hair or I'll, obviously I'm more, even more modest for those particular scenarios. But it felt wrong that for a certificate purpose that I would have to cover up. And I remember sat there like with a photographer my husband in the background i'm going like this because it just didn't feel it didn't feel right i was being dishonest to the sheikh and dishonest to myself so that didn't sit right with me and when we did go and see the sheikh i remember being battered with all these questions now these sheikhs are very 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 intelligent uh, guys and they were questioning my my faith they were questioning my religion and questioning what knowledge of Arabic I had and very basically it was like a test a very big test like an exam uh, you'd be happy to know I passed it and I said to them I don't understand I'm still like confused.com I still don't understand why I need a certificate to prove that I'm Muslim but this was their tradition this was their rule I guess in Egypt it must be just in Egypt not nobody nowhere else and um they just said this is something we all do and i said no in other cultures in other traditions they don't they don't ask for a certificate maybe it's something you just do here that's special to you and i remember him saying to me you know you need to do this and you need to do that and don't do this and i remember him saying to my husband like don't force her because i mentioned the scarf issue i raised it and i said i feel really uncomfortable i personally for me it feels like it's it's drowning me at that time and it's like anxiety issues are coming back and my panic attacks are coming back and it's not something i feel comfortable doing for my own personal reasons and you know he looked at me and he said to my husband in arabic you should only wear the headscarf if you want to wear it if you wish to wear it when you're ready to wear it go ahead but don't let anybody force you. Same with prayer. Like when, when you come in to pray, whether you pray five times a day, one time, the fact is that you know your relationship with Allah. You know, as, as you can pray and it's your deeds, it's your actions, it's things that you know in your heart 
are pure and are clean and your intention is there. And that's what Allah will judge you on. And he said this to my husband as well. And my husband was like nodding his head. Move forward, moving forward. Um, you know, years into the future now, 2020, one of the things that I'm still faced with is quite hard and it's quite challenging. And that is, oh, you're a Muslim. You don't look like a Muslim. Uh, yeah, you don't look like a Muslim. And my response will be, well, what do you mean by that? And they don't know how to answer it. Oh, I just didn't think because you're from England, you're not a Muslim. That's one response I've had. Or some has been, you know, well, you don't dress with a headscarf. Okay, that's fine. And then I've given my opinion about that. But then the person who's asking me the question, and it's female actually, not male. The female is also not wearing a headscarf and is also Muslim asking me that question. So it seems almost like hypocritical, sorry, hypocritical double standards. The Arabic word is like manafak. Now, it puzzles you, like, where's this judgmentality coming from? And in 2020, the reason, you know, the, the whole point of me doing this video, the whole point of me mentioning this topic is there is so much pressure from society, from our parents, from our siblings, from all angles without us realising it of why, 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 why. And when I do the whole why, it's not what, why aren't you doing this? And, uh, you know, why aren't you thinking of your family? Why aren't you thinking of your tradition? Why aren't you thinking of your hadith? Why aren't you thinking of your deen? Why aren't you thinking of judgment day? Why, can you get what I'm, the point I'm getting at? It's this constant, constant narrative of judgmentality, in my opinion, of other people making assumptions and other people making, um, whether they realise it or not, it's that judgmentality and accusationally sort of like tone, language, um, questioning you, questioning your identity all the time. Look at yourself first. Look at your own hadith first. Look at your own judgmentality first. Look at your own deeds. Uh, sorry, deeds. Look at your own conduct in life. Are you a good human being? Are you kind? Are you compassionate? Are you caring? Do you show love and compassion to your neighbours, your community? Do you help somebody who's in need? Or do you just do it because, or um, I did it because here I am taking a selfie and it's an opportune time? Look at yourself first before you start asking me certain questions. That's my first point. Second point is, yeah, I choose not to wear a headscarf. Now, as, a, as an adult, 42 years of age, yes, I choose not to wear a headscarf. That's my choice, my decision, my wish. If at some later stage in my life, I decide to wear it again, it's my choice, my opinion, my faith. Doesn't take away the fact that I'm not a Muslim just because I don't cover up in a particular way. As I've said previously, there has been situations, in, our, in fact, I'll show you some pictures where I have gone, to, for example, I went to Abu Dhabi uh, Sheikh Zayed Mosque, mashallah, very, 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 very beautiful place. Beautiful, most serene, serene place I've been to in my life. And I wore a headscarf. You also had to wear a galabaya or arabaya, you know, covered down to your feet so that you are showing no bits of flesh. Now that's not just to me, that's to tourists coming in. And in fact, some of the tourists have loved wearing the abaya or the niqab or the headdress. They've loved that opportunity. And that's their decision. They're happy to do that. That's their choice. For me personally, this is how I am. Since I've worked in the Middle East, my clothing has changed. A lot of it is because of the culture that I'm in and the culture that I'm respecting. So for example, um, my trousers were obviously always down to my ankle, of course. Um, but my blouses, for example, are longer. And now I'm tall, I'm five foot, five foot 10. And it's been a blessing in two ways coming out here. Number one, I can find blouses from, from my height that are perfect. And um, you'll know this if you're a tall person, sometimes some of the blouses, like literally it looks like you're showing off um, your midriff. Um, 
some of the blouses here are long and beautiful and it's part of the modesty but it's also a fashion thing but they look so nice and serene and calming on your body they flatter you actually and the rules we have in the middle east and in egypt when i worked there is and because i'm in education there are some strict rules and it's rules about like for example um in egypt it was you you must cover your shoulder so this is for obviously i worked in an english school an international school but you must cover your shoulder now for some women that were coming over from england that would be a big issue they'd be like no i want to wear my tank top no it's not professional but the rule is cover your shoulder so some of us had to wear the jacket some of those people didn't it's that type of thing um the rule we have here is you must cover you must cover and excuse my language but you must cover your backside as a female so you must have a blouse that covers that aspect of your body it's about modesty and it's about the fact that you are working in or living in a very conservative part of the world now if i was back in england i know full well there are fashions i remember seeing things in monsoon monsoon's a brilliant example monsoon would have all and zara monsoon would have all these flowery uh, like kaftaka tops and the linen tops and a lot of them were long and flowy and designed and when i've moved out here i can see why because it's the same style it's the exact same style so there's no there's no like um difference i guess to to how you sort of style and fashion yourself okay now obviously since i've been here in the middle east the fashions have changed big time the hijab style the niqab whatever you want to say has changed now some women in certain countries like france um even other countries um especially when there's been less tolerance i guess for the muslim faith because of radicalism because of islamophobia because of various other issues unfortunately some of the muslim sisters have been targeted because of their headscarf i'm not refusing to wear it because of that i'm saying this is my own personal um view this is my own personal belief that i don't need to wear that particular piece of cloth to identify or conduct myself as a muslim as i've already explained in my video nowadays moving forward there's been so many styles and there's some awesome women out there awesome women out there you know rocking these hijabs they look awesome some of them look stunning absolutely stunning and to me they look absolutely beautiful mashallah but still you'll get some of them getting criticism constantly getting criticism this isn't this in this way this is not being a muslim uh, this is not proper hijabi i can remember i think she's called dina tokia uh, dina tokia and i apologize if i say the name wrong the surname wrong um she wore the hijab i think for a very very long time and i remember having a conversation with my friend i'd only started to follow her only a while back and that's only because her husband is um patan like me i believe and she has got egyptian ancestry and roots like my husband so it was almost like the the twin but but opposite of us two so i only followed her for that and i was watching some of her uh videos where she's teaching her husband the arabic and he's teaching her the pushta so that's how i got into her but i remember at the time the whole massive friction within the muslim community even from friends basically saying but that's it we're not following her anymore we're not following her videos anymore we're un unfollowing her from instagram we're doing this and that and that's because she made the decision and that's up to her that's her life her choice but she decided not to wear the hijab anymore you can go and watch her i'm sure it explains it why but she faced uproar absolute uproar and lots of judgment and my heart goes excuse me my heart goes out to her because that just shows you the judgment that's out there it shows the daggers really dagger at dawn out there so whilst you were conservative and whilst you were wearing the hijab the content and the material that you were saying the the messages that you were saying the didactic messages that you were passing to your community that was fine as long as you did what we what we wanted you to do you, as long as you conformed i guess is what i'm saying you were okay with that but as soon as she as soon as she didn't like that she becomes an enemy why she's still the person she's still the same individual she's not changing a whole lifestyle she's just decided 
that she doesn't want to wear the hijab anymore like me now why would that be any different my personal choice is not to wear it it's something i stand passionately with it's something i've explained in depth and again like i said to you why are we at this stage where we are mocking ridiculing humiliating humiliating people within our community who are muslim in their character in their deeds in their whole conduct in the way that they are with their families why are we so judgmental that's where we're wrong that's where we're really really wrong because the more you are like that with an individual trust me i am this type the more you throw it down my throat the more you backlash the more you are not accepting of me the more i'm going to rebel wouldn't it be better if i came at wearing the hijab in my own space and my own time my choice whereas if you are dictating it it does for a, for that individual become an oppression and there are people in the west and the east wherever you are that will see that piece of cloth like i said the signifier you know as a label as an identity of um you you are a muslim you know i had this debate before i remember seeing one of my friends uh posting something what she thought was innocently posted she posted something uh on facebook where it had like a contrast and this is at the time where i think france was trying to stipulate the rules about burqas and same with the uk they had all these different rules like for example in the banks in the uk you can't uh, come into the bank you must remove the helmet that we say for example you're riding a bike you must remove the helmet that's one of the rules and that is so that they don't think someone's gonna loot the bank okay and people went on this whole racist bandwagon i blame edl and i blame ukip and i blame um, bnp and all this for basically putting that out there but they um did this whole rally of like you know you must um stop wearing the burqa and the niqab and the hijab take them off take them off take them off and if you don't like it get out of our country that sort of racist vibe and that's also made some people extremely passionate to holding on to holding on to that um hijab and the abaya and the niqab and i'm all for that because you have to take a stand you have to take uh, uh you know your passionateness about your faith and your spirituality to a whole different level you've got to stand your ground of course you do what i disagreed about this status was it had a picture of a nun in a habit and it had a picture of i think the the woman in an abaya or something and and my thing was like comment to this person who i've known for a long time in my life we're talking over 20 something years what what are you on about and um i said you know this is a, a part of faith it's a part of identity it's a part of um who they are it's not about oppression it's not about control it's not about um they're covering up this 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 reason this is what this is where islam comes from i got backlash from that person because it was like well you don't wear it and you don't do this and you had issues and i said yes they were my personal issues but that doesn't mean it's the same for this particular woman and the other argument i got back from this individual was well the nun looks beautiful this woman doesn't and again i said that's your impression that's your perception that's your opinion you're entitled to it i'm going to disagree with you on this one but you can't compare a nun to someone wearing a hijab and tell one to take it off and the other not okay so we don't have the right to do that each person's faith each person's um understanding of the hijab is important and as i've said to you there's been events that have happened that unfortunately in our in our world has been very very much against islam and the faith and muslims there are times when we've been extremely targeted big time you'll have seen clips yourself where unfortunately you know people have been attacked and it tends to be the females not necessarily the males it tends to be the females that are on their own and they're wearing the hijab and they've been attacked and targeted because they stand out now i salute those ladies you know because it's not hard it's not easy to go through your life and also for standing the ground um i have utter admiration for them being in the middle east when you are about abroad and you're looking at different aspects of muslim you also see the change within generations so like i said to you i'm a 70s child i'm a late 70s child early 80s child 
Now I'm watching children from 2020 in the Muslim faith and I'm seeing, you know, their grandparents, for example, dressed, dressed in the traditional dishdash, as they call it, wearing a baya, the galabaya. You know, being abroad in all these countries, you learn all the different uh, outfits. And then I'm seeing them change and becoming, I guess, what someone might call more westernized, you know, wearing the tracky bottoms, the top. Some of the girls actually are more westernized than I would see back in England. That's the truth. So it's funny, isn't it, how clothes can change, but at the core of it, they're still Muslim, they still pray, they still conduct themselves in a beautiful manner, okay? And that's what we're forgetting. We're forgetting when we judge someone, when we are targeting someone, when we are labeling someone, questioning someone. Now, questioning in the sense of, okay, you might be just like, well, why do you wear that? Question. And it's a curiosity one, whether it's for knowledge or to be educated. That There's that aspect. Totally, totally, totally understand that aspect. Then there's the other side of things where you're not actually using it for that. You're using it to beat someone over the head with, okay? You're doing it because you are angry, you are hostile. And as I said before, unfortunately, because of certain events, whether it's 9-11, whether it was bombings in London whether it's um, events that have happened throughout the world where unfortunately a, min a minority have ruled it, uh, has ruined it, should I say, for the rest of us. Unfortunately, the majority of Muslims that are peaceful, that are tranquil, that are leading a good life, that are being good citizens, that are choosing to dress in a particular way or not dress in a particular way, that's been lost. That's been lost and that's a shame. So to summarize and to basically conclude, should you see someone that you think may be Muslim or not, you may have tactical ways now of maybe approaching that person and you may not. Maybe this video gets you to look at things in a different light, maybe, maybe not. The thing to go away with is look at the person as a whole don't just look at what's on top of their head or not on top of their head or the way that they are dressed. That is not up to you to judge. That is what we do in society. It is something we do in our community. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter which culture you're in, there is always going to be that aspect of that part of human beings, I guess, that we can't help it. This is, this is the way we're wired when we're out in the community. So we're not born with it. We are definitely not born with it. It's the way we're wired. It's the way we're conducted. And that can change, by the way, you know, that can change. It can be behavior that we can unlearn and it can be behavior that we can move forward with and set a precedence that the values and the traditions and the five pillars of Islam don't refer to certain concepts, certain aspects that you think Islam and being a Muslim is all about. Anyone that is out there questioning whether to take the hijab or not to wear the hijab, that's down to you. That personally is down to you. It is your uh, faith. It is your faith that is going to be questioned when we face judgment day, which is, you know, what we're all told about. The main thing is about how, how we are here in the here and now. And our past self, we can make mistakes, we can put them right, we can ask for forgiveness, but we can also um, move forward and be a better human being. And this is what I keep coming back to. It all comes from here. When we die, your body doesn't go with you. The items of clothing don't go with you. It's your soul, it's your essence, it's your being that will be questioned on judgment day. And that's what I think people forget. They forget that. People have a way of putting things right. Now I've told you about my father, maybe at some point in the future, inshallah, don't know maybe things will be rectified other members of my family don't have an issue with some of these things that I'm discussing with you some do friends that know me that have known me for a long time in my life they've loved me and accepted me yes we've had ding-dongs yes we've had disagreements <laughs> who hasn't and same in your marriage same in your relationship with people that you've got that are close to you you will have situations where you will face certain things in your life that will be like a, like a wall, bang, 
bang, the same issue keeps coming up, the same issue keeps coming up. And that's why today I felt the need to, to address these issues because I'm tired of it. I am sick and tired of it. And for me, I want to let it go. And here I am, I'm going to let it go. And if you have an issue with me not wearing my hijab, you got your answer. Like it or lump it. Anyway, take care. Keep safe, guys, because, you know, life is tough at the moment with everything going on with COVID. Stay safe. Look out for each other. Respect each other. Love one another. And just let's be good human beings.